Good evening and welcome to Gunner Shot. Today we're going to look at the emerging security architecture in East Asia. Or is ke baare mein baat karne ke liye mere saath hai Brigadier Arun Sagar. First let me welcome him and then I'll set the context. Sir, good, good evening and uh, welcome back to Gunner Shot sir. We are meeting now after a very long time and it's a pleasure to have you back here. Uh and we're going to talk of a very interesting subject which we have discussed the security architecture in east asia now when i say east asia i'm talking of a large swath of territory a complete uh, you, know, actually, you could call it east asia you could call it the western pacific right and the elephant in this ocean is obviously china why are we talking about this i mean everyone should understand hum iske bare mein kyu baat kar rahe हम इसीलिए बात कर रहे हैं कि आज के दिन आप देखो चाइना और ताइवान का रोज कुछ न कुछ प्रॉब्लम होता है राइट मिलिट्री प्रॉब्लम होता है ऑफ कोर्स पॉलिटिकल प्रॉब्लम तो है ही बट रोज दे सम एयरक्राफ्ट वायलेशन सम मिलिट्री एक्सरसाइज और ये बढ़ता जा रहा है एवरी डे आई सी समथिंग और हैपनिंग अदर हैपनिंग इन फिलीपींस राइट सबाइना शोल एंड सेकंड थॉमस शोल के इर्द गिर्द रोज मुक्का मुक्की हो रहा है कुछ न कुछ हो रहा है कुछ इट्स अ इट्स अ होल लॉर्ड ऑफ हाइब्रिड ग्रे जोन वॉरफेयर गोइंग ऑन इन दैट एरिया और तो और वियतनाम हैज आल्सो स्टार्टेड क्लेमिंग आइलैंड्स एंड दे हैव स्टार्टेड ब्रिजिंग एंड बिल्डिंग आइलैंड्स इनफैक्ट आई सॉ अ रिपोर्ट वेयर दे हैव सेड व्हाट दे हैव डन इन द पास्ट 4 इयर्स दे हैव डन इन द पास्ट 1 ईयर दे हैव स्पीडेड अप ऊपर China is uh, making lot of military movements around the Senkaku Islands. So Japan is also, uh, you know, come into the fray. And then USA is always there. Today I read a report, just today, that USA is going to have some basing facilities on the northern tip of Philippines Island, one of the islands, which one is overlook the, the Luzon and the Bashi Straits. Yeah. which actually forecloses if that is the case almost forecloses uh you know chinese invasion of taiwan because any invasion of taiwan to just put the put it on record needs a logistics base and that logistics base if those of you who know military affairs has to be developed from the south only right american presence there stops it so every day and because of china's militarization all the countries right from south south korea japan taiwan uh, we'll have a look at the map so that you are in uh, focus south korea japan taiwan malaysia indonesia philippines vietnam they are all militarizing what's more the siam reap base the riam base of cambodia is now ready and where chinese are operating and chinese are making a canal along through cambodia to reach that so there are a lot of military developments happening in this area to offset this all countries are arming themselves and they are all getting into new uh, you know bilaterals and trilaterals and security cooperation things and all that so there's a new network emerging in east asia we need to understand what this network is all about we also need to understand where we stand in this network how do we handle this network remember one overarching uh, network in this architecture is the quad so where does quad fit in where does india fit in so all these questions are vexing questions our elections are over but the outflow of that election is china is cutty more with india than it was before the elections which means we need to take more interest in this part of the world right so it, for all this uh, i request brigadier arun sagal sir the floor is yours please take on sir okay 
Thank you very much, Jal Shankar sir. Uh, it is always a pleasure to be on your channel and discuss issues of what well, called great strategic concern, but which are somehow not given the kind of predominance that it requires. Uh, I will cover my remarks under four headings. My first, I will just take a cursory look at the emerging global order, which is which I call a period of contestation. Uh, we will you. I will then just quickly deliberate on the contours of confrontation. Uh, in the third part, I will look at the Chinese and U.S. attempts at creating a security architecture in support of their own interests, and I will finish by uh, highlighting certain imperatives of India's security dynamics, particularly in the IOR. So this is how I will uh, cover my remarks. Uh, first, first fundamental point we need to understand is that we are entering a period of unprecedented strategic competition. This strategic competition is now marked by, by the attempts by the United States to create a, to maintain this unipolarity in the global order and continue to be the prima donna in the international geopolitical and economic system. And that is being contested by China, supported by Russia, which is attempting to contest this previous primacy and bring in a change in the existing economic, political, and even a technological order based on their concept of what they call uh, area period of common destiny of mankind and supported by initiatives like global security initiative, global development initiative of which the BRI is part and also try to create in particularly in among the global south and in East and in, in, in Asia the construct of global civilizational initiative so so the whole idea is that there are two now different streams of global system which are now emerging and this is something which uh, these axes uh, are important to understand because they are the ones that is that is where the contestation is going to come about uh, the as far as the eastern axis is concerned is apart from the fact that the, the, the there is a war going on in Ukraine, the important thing to understand is that there is a more coming out strategy by the Chinese in support of the Russian uh, efforts, both in economic as well as military terms, not so much in giving them arms, but giving them a support system and backup in terms of uh, accessories and, and critical items which support the Russian uh, military capabilities. Added to that is this whole issue of uh, their attempts to create a, some, which General Shankar and his some of his talks have already highlighted, what I call a crink. The crink is China, Russia, Iran, North Korea axis, which is, uh, so So the, what we are looking at now is, and third, of course, is the Gaza area, Gaza uh, contest, which is going on. And, and here again, it's a very fascinating context that while the Israelis uh, are, are battering the daylight out of the poor Palestinians and the, and the Hamas and, and, the, and the poor people in Gaza, there is not a squeak in the international system against this. People just make very, very small, you know, uh, 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 weak remarks, which means nothing. And above all, the Arab world itself is, is disparate about this whole issue. They are not united. So the question basically is this, is, is that in the geopolitical context, that at one level, the United States is now involved in three contests, Ukraine, Gaza, and in Indo-Pacific. The the only people who are trying to contest this is the new block of what I call the Eastern, Eastern block of China, Russia, 
and or what we can roughly drink and they're supporting supporters so this is how the how the uh, the ball game is being played uh, the important thing here to understand is this is that despite the fact the gaza is an ongoing conflict the uh, uh, the ukraine is an ongoing conflict the important thing of the indo pacific is this is it is the direct united states involvement in this conflict in other two conflicts the united states has a proxy involvement the ukraine war is being fought through weapon systems intelligence and other support including now f16s to ukraine the front ending is done by ukrainians in in gaza front ending is done by israelis by supporting them. but here there is no front ending it's a direct contest between china led uh, china supported uh, powers including north korea russia and the united states and its allies and strategic partners so this is the narrative that we need to understand so when we come to the dynamics at play in southeast asia and uh, east asia i like to highlight an interesting facet i mean the interesting facet of asia is this asia has three important powers or important players on whom the geopolitics and geo strategic construct of the region rests in the north is china which is essentially continental and it is now trying to emerge as a maritime uh, and a rimland power trying to ensure that its immediate maritime spaces are dominated and build up capacities and capabilities to go beyond the first island chain and the second island chain the other side of the uh, this thing is that it is trying to incubate south china sea as a part of a chinese lake to a to ensure that it's the chinese homeland han china's mainland which is which is the industrial belt of china is 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 given a adequate strategic depth as also to ensure that it controls the strategic waterways through whom nearly 60% of the trade in this region passes the second element of this triangle is the us allies and the uh, us and its allies particularly in east asia and western pacific they are collaborating collating together we we'll talk about how in a, in a while to ensure that the china remains constrained and the third element of this whole triangle is india which is the western book and dominating a major player i won't say dominating as a major player in the indian ocean region which is trying to ensure that a strategic balance in the region is not upended by chinese provocations and chinese actions so here in this triangle us and i and india have a joint interest a collaborative interest to ensure that i will not use the word contain china but constrain china and constrainment is essentially a function of making the other party believe that it has to follow rules of law and has to be restrained in his actions and not bully others and weaker players so this is how the game is being played so now i'll come to the dynamics at play uh, in east asia and uh, southeast asia and then uh, before i come to that should you have any questions on this part i will uh, uh, i'm so uh, i'm okay with what you said but i think apart from cricket apart from this thing i think there is a contestation for uh, the supremacy which is actually a subplay of the islamic world where you see powers like iran uh, saudi arabia and turkey you know playing out though the arab world is uh, quiet about the israel gaza war they're not able to do something but this is a contestation which goes on this is important because in the long run energy 
is going to matter. And once energy matters, which way this part of the globe swings also will you know, matter. To some extent, I think this needs a little mention. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more on this issue. Uh, the, the Islamic factor is very, very important. Uh, so, so I, let me cover this part of this when I come to the third part, India and the IOR. But okay, now I come, uh, sir. Uh, as far as the Southeast Asia and East Asia are concerned, let me start by highlighting some aspects of the Chinese thinking. What the Chinese are up to? The Chinese big concern is that it has a concern of major global powers acting in unison on its, on its east. And for them, the fulcrum of that contestation is Taiwan. It is also trying to, through its actions in Philippines and other places, is trying to stop, like you rightly said in your opening remarks, the power projection of the Chinese beyond the Bashai and Luzo channels. Now, the the important facet for the Chinese, therefore, is this, that it can be a big power, it can be a big player, it can have the largest navy in the world, but it has, where do it go? Where, how does it project power? So, so the important thing from the Chinese perspective is this, that China believes that until unless I make a breakthrough today, tomorrow or day after, Chinese intentions or Chinese great national perception of being a global power will always remain constrained in Asia. It will be checkmated by the, the Western construct uh, uh, of, the, of the US ally system over here. So when you look at the region from the Chinese perspective, the Chinese are very clear that something has to give and something that has to give is that we would have ultimately have a conflictual scenario. Is the time now? Clearly, in my perception, no. Is the time tomorrow? Maybe. But is the time down the line another 15, 20 years? It will all depends on how China uses its power and influence. And here, the Chinese power and influence is not only military power and influence. But it is also technological and is uh, and is economic power. So the break could come under various circumstances. Scenario one, which I look at, is which is being played out right now, is posturing, contestation, and continuously pushing the agenda through gray zone operations to ensure that there is strategic instability in the region. And as the Shangri-La dialogue brought out, the regional players, and this is important, sir, the regional players who are economically intertwined with, uh, with China have the difficulties of choice in terms of becoming a credible contestive partner with the uh, Western Alliance system or the American Alliance system. Yesterday, in a, uh, or two days back, in a discourse, a, a very, very important Chinese, I mean, a Japanese uh, analyst said, he said, you have to understand this. We have to be sure of in any escalation that America would act in concert with our interests. And America... So the bottom line which he's asking is, is United States going to go to war in support of Japan, Korea or Philippines? Yes or no? Which will escalate into a hot conflict? No. Now here lies the dilemma. And here lies the some kind of a, of a, of a card with the Chinese play. Chinese are trying, they are contesting United States power and influence through military and other technological means. But they are also putting pressure on these middle powers in the region and telling them the consequences of their action and A, B, that the United States is not a reliable partner. 
So this is how the Chinese are playing the game. And in this, we see the actions that are taken by the, 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 the what is it called the famous sword exercise, which they took a lot recently in against Taiwan and 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 joint sword taking, joint sword exercise and the, and the action that they're taking against Philippines are, are part and parcel of coercive tactics and this coercion will continue and the question is also a psychological game being played this is something which we 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 tend to overlook psychological war as you are rightly written so much about is a part and parcel of the Chinese construct so this is where the whole issue lies. From the Chinese perspective, this is the game of, of, of great psychological uh, game which is being played to, to clearly create in the minds of the smaller powers, not so much the United States, that ability of the United States to come to their assistance. Same thing happened. We were discussing the Senkaku Island where the Chinese four ships landed up over there the other day. The whole idea was this. Japanese are not over, uh, sh sure whether the, if there is an escalation or this tends into hot war, the the uh, Americans will support them. They might say so. They might do it. Okay. So this is as far as the Chinese perspective. I'm broadly, I'm talking about. The second issue, sir, is the issue of the new collective security architecture with the Americans are trying. Americans are aware of this. Americans are aware of this. So what they are trying to do is that they are trying to create a multi uh, number of multilaterals, trilaterals, bilaterals, having various kinds of various levels of uh, of, of meetings. There was a there's a summit in Washington between Korea and Philippines. There's a summit between Australia, J Japan, and United States. There was also a meeting in Honolulu with, where Austin held a meeting with all the other four players uh, in the region. The whole idea is of this whole initiative is to consolidate both collective security and enhance and upend the military capabilities. That's, that's the bottom line. So what are they trying to do? At the interesting part was in the 40 minute meeting which took place with the with the Philippine defense minister and from where this whole concept of so-called squad came about, the whole idea basically is this, is that like you also rightly said, that Americans will upgrade their deployments in the region. They have deployed what is called a triumph system or a triumph in the Northern Islands. There are three islands over there, the Northern Islands. The whole idea is to create an adequate deployment which ensures that the, it becomes a credible deterrence to the Chinese incursions or the Chinese coercion tactics. If that's the only game over here. The second element is, which you have widely discussed and we have discussed in the past, is the Bosha, the Luzon Channel are the main entry points into the South China Sea. Now, the Americans want to ensure that these entry points are never, never, ever uh, are close to the Chinese uh, to the American shipping. The American flotilla essentially takes about four to five days to move from Guam into this region. So if they if they don't have deployments, credible deployments, they need that much of time. And so they want to ensure to forward deployments and forward systems in place to ensure that the Chinese cannot upstage them in this region. The 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 second element of this whole thing is that they are now entering into a multi-domain uh, 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 cooperative system. Of one is the intelligence, coordinated intelligence, coordinated air defense, okay, and joint patrolling, joint uh, exercises, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The, the, the Americans have done close to about over 300 exercises. There is a uh, there is a report of the double IWS. A recent meeting where they have they have highlighted the number of exercises the Americans have done with just about everybody. The idea of these exercises is two, threefold. One is interoperability, give assurance to the partners that the Americans are over there, and to showcase to the to the other side to the Chinese that they would be present over there. 
there are a number of exercises which are being planned in in australia this year there is there is also this whole issue of what is called the uh, uh wait a minute uh, uh, joint uh, uh, a rapid uh, uh, reciprocal access agreement which have been signed reciprocal access agreement which have been signed between the japanese and the australians which basically means that the f35 from one country can be deployed over there to the other country so the idea basically is this that the the entire security architecture is not only been upgraded but it is also getting integrated added to that is that since the uh, irf treaty is no longer is in existence the americans are also making plans to deploy uh, possibly should the push come to shove some intermediate nuclear uh, forces or nuclear systems which are which is part of the part of extended deterrence both for japan and uh, korea they are in addition to going back to the small islands which they jumped uh during the second world war uh in their battle for guam and the battle for uh, coming close to japan those islands are being resurrected by airfields etc etc with, with maritime deployments to, to basically to ensure that there is adequate forces are available now the question comes is is it adequate this is something which which we as analysts need to understand uh, to to discern i not understand to discern essentially speaking the chinese have got anti excess air denial strategy basically to deal with these items to these de deployments will they be able to do it answer is yes or no number of war games number of simulation exercises are held which basically means there will be a large scale damage to both sides but the ability to able to constrain one or the other will remain a question mark what happens is if there is a hot war that starts between china and and united states and its allies will it and as a consequence of that war the mainland china is hit now if the mainland china is hit by american forces or american elements then the issue becomes larger so then you are then united states is not at war or not fighting a defensive and a battle of 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 ensuring uh, dominance of his area of influence but then america is now fighting a war of uh, a, a conflict direct conflict with the chinese so how will that play out is something which is a, and my impression is at this point in time both china and united states are clearly aware that this is too serious a business to get involved but there is a joker in the pack the joker in the pack is north korea and other um, who can upset the entire apple cart by a rash and 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 a stupid action like hitting the the uh, the japanese or 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 hitting the north, uh, south koreans in any case he has already is appended the treaty with the with south korea so this is what the scenario is that is playing out in this region uh i'll stop here if you have any any comments or any any issues i will uh, i will uh, try and answer so, them or make give a clarification right so uh, let's consider a scenario okay. uh i mean actually the two scenarios which you have broadly outlined which will continue in east asia and the western pacific the first scenario is you'll see a series of gray zone actions interminably around philippines scarborough shoal thomas shoal all that then of course there'll be some growling around taiwan and hmm. japan hmm. and north korea doing something you know in the north uh, against south korea but all these so far for the past 3 years I have not led to even a bullet being fired exactly the moment a bullet is fired anywhere this things will start escalating hmm. whether we like it or not the first thing which i would like you to probably analyze is china in a position to go in for a war 
I mean, in the sense that willy nilly, can China handle? I mean, assuming that you know something will happen, the moment something happens, escalation, how it goes, and USA is probably uh, sucked into the whole system. Can will China risk or can China handle? Will it risk or can it handle a simultaneous confrontation with, say, three four nations backed by USA? Because a whole lot of it depends on China's acceptance of that risk or China's willingness to go to that war and China's capability to go for that, you know, for that contact. Uh, we need to look at that we, because why I'm saying this is why we I'll need answer to that, debate I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. I'll answer that. Sir. Answer. Uh, why, why, is, why is this? It's a very fundamental thing is that we expect China to go to war. But will it go to war is a million dollar question. True. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, the short answer is, short answer is, as we have seen uh, on our own borders for the last nearly four and a half years now, four years plus, is the fact is that the Chinese are maintaining a status quo ante posture. But yet, is despite building up all kinds of resources being built up, J20 is being deployed, forward area is done, there is a degree of restraint and discretion. The same degree of restraint and discretion exists in the East. The rationale for it is very simple. The rationale is that until and unless the war escalates into the nuclear domain in in the in the conventional domain if there is a conflict and chinese uh, are unable to get any of the victory or get only a partial victory and the chinese homeland is attacked by conventional united states forces or allied forces how will the Chinese operate? How, how will it impact the leadership's perspective? Can China, then, the, then the next element of that comes in and as part of an escalation strategy is that the American, Chinese will start looking at nuclear asset or, or starting doing a brinkmanship of the nuclear asset. So in, in, in all probability, after a small or a, or a limited exchange of, of, of of fire between the two sides, which includes Taiwan, which includes Philippines, and also the mainland China, as well as the American territories, which are be, will be attacked, as well as Japan, etc., etc. There may be an attempt to bring about a ceasefire. Now, the question with the Chinese face is, like I said in the beginning, for China to emerge as a global power, it has to get out of Asian containment. That Asian containment is something which is which is trying to restrain Chinese emergence as a great power. Its BRI and other elements are not working that well. Its strategic influence are limited. It just did 11 exercises last year with SCOs and other places. It has, there are no other players who does any exercise. Its leverages globally are there in terms of cash and carry uh, strategy. But they are not there in terms of, of any, any hardcore uh, interest-based uh, alliance system or interest-based partnerships. They are not there. So the question for the Chinese is basically is this. Is their posturing, high-ending the posturing, great degree of brinkmanship is the only answer to keep the other person tied up. And therefore, we... As a, and they are being greatly supported by the discourse in the West, which is talking about two things. The futility of a war with China, futility of conflict with China, and also they are talking about is futility of economic and technological war with China. These are part and parcel of, like you very rightly say, as a part of parcel of influence operations being launched by the Chinese using virtual means to ensure that. To that extent, sir, Japanese are kosher, Chinese are kosher at this point in time. They don't, have, they have no intention 
in the for the next 10 years to to attack uh, taiwan or anything capture the any any territory by force as long as they can browbeat they can deploy they can posture they can uh, they can sell their credibility credibly sell their uh, military power and which like we as uh, particularly i call myself a one of people who get self deterred by the chinese power and influence they are they are happy they don't have to do anything so in the scenario what we are talking about is that it will not be a large scale conflict even if the conflict breaks out it will be a limited conflict and which will not escalate into a nuclear dimension that's my my analysis sir uh, that's fine sir that's a fair one i, I mean I'm, i also agree because if you see the way they went about what they did with us in eastern ladakh doklam after all, uh, you know all of us tend to see the chinese uh, friction points uh, separately but when you look at it from the entirety of Do- what happened in doklam what happened in 2020 in eastern ladakh where they tried something big and failed and uh, what happened later in yangze which i thought was the tip of a arrow which got blunted if you see these three th- issues in their larger spectrum Uh, certain limitations of china come in notwithstanding all their thing and uh, right so with that kind of a thing if you look at what's happening in the philippines after all say two years back one year back the philippines problem wasn't so high right now so if you look at the from i mean i'm looking at it from the chinese point of view they always were focusing on taiwan now all of a sudden they have to start doing something with philippines and mind you if you've been following what's happening in philippines they're not coming well off they're not yeah, able, yeah. able to handle they're not able to handle philippines yeah. and my yeah. personal thing is that i think all of us who have problems of china need to study what's happening in philippines the way philippines is handling it it's handling it through you know it's a multi domain operation and china philippines is doing its own trick and the fact that you know uh, 3 years back or 2 years back there was no talk of china and japan ever having a military even a you know stare at each other but today it's more why i'm I... saying is oh, yes sir uh, what the last no, thing no no so no no the la- uh, ab boli sorry i apologize for no 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 so no, uh, the, the last line, line in fact is that i think china is a bit overstretched so yeah okay okay so philippines is a very interesting example you know during your uh, opening remarks you talked about quad now philippines is a interesting example where all four quad partners have come together to arm to philippines to, yes. to provide military arms to philippines and this is a great example of how four quad partners who are not in any security architecture but can support an an important player who is on the cusp of 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 being coerced by a, a stronger player they can come together to support it we are providing them with brahmos missile system tactical missile system which uh, which are which are in, very important for the for the philippines the uh, the uh, security system being provided and the, uh, and the dual use system being provided by the japanese the australians are providing them with equipment and resources and radars and, things, and of course americans are deploying their forward assets including tomahawks and things like that so this is this is an uh, a classic example a classic example of quads efficacy if there is any so so and this is not lost to the chinese this is not lost to the chinese and 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 now when we are looking at the vietnamese issue which you also talked about if you are looking at the vietnamese issue the same architecture can happen yes india providing uh, india we are already providing submarines we have already got resources there we, we have got a a 100 million dollar uh, line of credit on defense etc etc and we given them petrol boats also 
and patrol boats we can give them tomorrow somebody we can do anything and we and we have a reason for of course going there in support of our uh, our uh, assets uh, in the tonkin gulf uh, our, our 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 economic assets in the tonkin gulf etc the americans are there the 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 uh, the, uh, the japs are having a very good relationship with them i have no idea about the australian vietnamese relationship i presume is equally good so you know so what is the thing a new and interesting uh, 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 dimension is emerging where quad although not being quad is supporting a critical element of, of a country now see and there is one more issue that we need to look at and that brings me to the east asia focus the if the issue that we need to look at is that this domination and control over the outlets out of south china sea is further constricting the chinese strategic space although they are building up new islands they are building up new uh, uh, force structures on those islands they are deploying missiles they are doing h6 bomber they can do anything that they want but the fact of the matter is this that on the western flank as the time goes india will become a strong player and india will also start moving into the direction of procuring the outlets from the south china sea into the indian ocean region as a part of his of his rightful security requirement so we will look at sunda we will look at lombok lombok we expect the australians to do something sunda we, uh, we is an area that we can also look at the australians can look at but certainly the bay of bengal malacca strait and across the on the other side of the malacca is an would become an area of influence now you please look at the architecture now one hand india's area of influence is increasing as china tries to increase its its footprint in the indian ocean region on the other hand the the outlet is con- 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 controlled by the american led alliance system and uh, so the the great two nations uh, two ocean strategy of the of the chinese is under under great degree of stress now this is something we need to work on it's not going to happen just like that it's something yeah, yeah. to work on this is the architecture i was talking about when you're talking about the indian ocean region therefore credibility of ensuring criticality of bay of bengal that means south from starting from uh, hambantota going right up to uh, myanmar going right up to bangladesh this area cannot be allowed to be controlled by anybody else other than us and our strategic partners so therefore this is where we need to be a uh, focus upon in our terms of our area domination by our maritime uh, assets on the other hand gwadar is coming into a big focus we are aware of the fact that the uh, shah sharif was told in no uncertain terms that the chinese want uh, to develop this as an important base that they will and there is now a new element which we are listening to is the first overseas chinese command which is going to come up in djibouti with a major base in uh, in uh, this place in uh, in gwadar and some elements of that being also integrated with uh, along with the russians with the iranians now the russian angle in this whole game is becoming very interesting now, with the opening of the rail route from the caspian sea right up to bandrabas and which is now becoming an eastern uh, east eurasia uh, trade route uh, as part of the iron's stc india north international north south trading corridor so so there are large number of these elements that are in play but the important point is that we have to understand from our perspective our dealing with the chinese challenge is that a squeeze from the south china sea uh, uh, from the west and squeeze from the east and constraining chinese ability to to deploy a so called large scale career battle groups out in the open in, in uh, is something which will need to be closely looked into by by uh, the the military planners who want peace and stability i e the quadrilateral
So this is something which I wanted to highlight. All yours, sir. Oh, fine, sir. I think uh, we've covered a whole lot of things and what uh, the East Asia security architecture would look like and what it should look like and where India fits, right? Which you so nicely put that as India rises and its uh, area of influence, the sphere of influence increases, we're going to overlap the ambitions of China and those will be our friction points. And right. And it's no more just the LAC. The LAC is just one part. And my my view is that, fine, uh, uh, China can deploy what it wants that side and the uh, infrastructure is better the other side. There's no doubt about it. But over the past three, four years, we have improved our infrastructure. Absolutely. As Absolutely. our infrastructure keeps improving, the ability of China to do anything funny here is actually decreasing. Yes. Right. In fact, on the other hand, uh, they have to start looking at defending themselves at some point of time, which so, hitherto for they have not done. So actually, the my view is the LAC is going to flip in the way things are operating in a matter of two to three years. But what's not going to flip is the expansion and the contestation in the seas. Yes. Right. And, and that's going to happen. And that's where the whole story is. And that's where probably our uh, focus has to be. And uh, I think uh, I'll leave it at that. Unless you have anything to add. Uh, and I'll yes, take some uh, questions. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share my two penny bit. No, no. So I thought you made some fantastic points today. Uh, giving an overview of how things develop. Because most of the time, otherwise, we are only looking at the LAC or you're looking at some incident which has happened in JNK. Or, you know, we are so besotted with our own uh, elections that we start losing the larger picture. And uh, and now that the elections are over, we need to get back to start looking at the larger picture outside. Because a lot of dynamics are happening uh, which we need to focus on. Uh, I... I, I in future, if I can make a small point, in future, uh, whenever you have the time, uh, thing, I would like to share with you some thoughts of uh, uh, strategic stability vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. Because I just come back from a big discussion with the Pakistanis on this. And I'll share some thoughts so that, you know, just to yeah. put a perspective in place and how they are thinking. Because they, what when we meet these guys, they are not has been there there we also get from them uh, the current people who are who are uh, Running deciding the, 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 uh, the strategy so if any you tell me the date no no you tell me the date and we'll fix it okay when i come back yeah. from the us i'm going to the us on the 17th so after that i'll come in. yeah when you come back sir on 24 25th when you wherever you come back uh, okay we'll, have it. we'll we'll do it sir. 